The Whistler. That whistle is your signal for the Whistler. I'm a whistler, and I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. Yes, friends, it's time for The Whistler, rated by Independent Research, the most popular West Coast program. And now, The Whistler's strange story... Backfire. Just a moment before, the music of the little tango orchestra had seemed pure magic to him as they sat at their special table in the soft, enchanting gloom of the Club Madrid. Now it was discordant, a cacophony of meaningless noise and maddening, pounding rhythms. And the club, the dancers, the slim vocalists with their maracas only heightened the despondency that settled on him like a cloud. And the thing that had worked the change, that had transformed magic into misery in a split second, was the thing that Amy had said, tossed across the table to him as if it had been a comment on the weather. I'm sorry, Carl. I don't love you. I never did. Amy, what are you saying? Really, darling, it isn't anything to look so serious about. You must have known that we couldn't go on like this forever. Amy, Amy, we can't just throw it all away. You've got to understand. Throw what away? Carl, dear, you're being awfully naive, don't you think? Amy, I love you. Is that naive? Is that stupid? Well, it doesn't make very good sense, dear. We've had three months, three wonderful, exciting months. Arnold's coming home tomorrow, and that is that. You know how he'd explode if he ever found out. No. Oh? When did you hear from him? Oh, he wired from San Francisco this morning. Aren't you just a little bit worried about him? Why? We've been discreet enough. You know, it's a little strange how a man can be so brilliant and so blind all at once. You almost look as if you delight in telling Arnold that. Yes. I'm afraid I can't afford to. Naturally. <laughs> You know, I think Arnold might resent it a little if he knew his wife had become romantically interested in her chauffeur. That puts me in my place quite nicely, Amy. It was meant to, darling. I suppose you run and get the car. I want to talk to the orchestra leader for a minute. Well, what are you waiting for? Of course, Mrs. Pearson. Right away. Of course, Mrs. Pearson, right away. You're back in your place now, aren't you, Carl? Yes, Mrs. Pearson. Of course, Mrs. Pearson. Right away, ma'am. Just like it was when you first came to the Pearson house over a year ago. Long before the thrilling, unbelievable discovery that Amy was interested in you. As you walk dumbly out of the nightclub, your mind goes back to the day Arnold Pearson hired you. Well, Carl... I have an idea you'll work out quite nicely. I understand you're an excellent driver and uh, mechanically inclined. That's right, Mr. Pearson. Not so much on my account. It's mainly because of Mrs. Pearson. I see. She's a very impetuous woman, inclined to be reckless. She's had two accidents now, rather narrow escapes. I'll feel much safer with a chauffeur for her. Of course. Mrs. Pearson becomes upset very easily, uh, emotionally rather unstable. When she's troubled, she has a strange habit of taking the car out and driving like the wind. I, uh, I'm afraid I don't understand. Well, neither do I, frankly. Somehow it seems to cool her down, quiet her nerves. I hope that with you here as chauffeur, she'll have to find some less dangerous antidote for these, uh, explosions of hers. Oh, I know I can help, sir. Uh, good. Then it's settled, Carl. I'm going to hire you. And as far as I'm concerned, a prison record means absolutely nothing if a man is really willing to profit by his mistakes. You'll have every chance to make good. Thank you, sir. Yes, Carl, you're back in your place. 
right where you were the day Arnold hired you, fresh out of state prison. And he hadn't thought of you since. To Arnold, you were a piece of equipment like a lawnmower or a washing machine, not a human being who might want something else from the world, something with pride and dignity. You hated him, didn't you, Carl? Him and his righteousness. And when Amy became interested in you, you wanted to scream in his face that if he didn't think you were somebody, his wife did. But that's all over now. The evenings at the Club Madrid with Amy are part of the past. She's uh, Mrs. Pearson again, and you're back in your place as chauffeur. You're a little uneasy when Arnold called you into his study on the night of his return. I... I don't quite know how to begin, Carl. Something rather unpleasant has been called to my attention. Uh, indeed, sir? Uh, first, however, I think I ought to tell you that I've advised my lawyers about you, Carl. You'll never want for anything, even if something should happen to me. Why... Why, that's very kind of you, sir. I had no idea oh, that Oh, you... I'm happy to do it, Carl. Oh. All I ask in return is... Is your confidence. It's about Mrs. Pearson. Mrs. Pearson? As you know, Carl, I'm quite well known. And, well, the fact of the matter is, a chap from the firm spoke to me about Amy this afternoon. He implied she'd been seen on a number of occasions in the company of a strange man. Oh, well, it's, it's probably only gossip, sir. I'm sure that... I hope it is just gossip. It sort of upset me, that's all. Coming home to a lot of ugly rumors about my wife and an orchestra leader. An orchestra leader? Yes. I believe he's working at the Club Madrid. That stopped you, didn't it, Carl? So, there was only one reason for all those evenings with Amy at the Club Madrid. Terry Larkin, the orchestra leader. You were stupid not to have seen it from the first... You're raging inside as you walk downstairs to the library. Amy is still there, curled up by the fireplace with a book. Hello, Amy. Oh, Carl. What's the matter, darling? I just talked to your husband. Seems there are rumors floating around. About us? No. No, not about us. Why, I don't understand. Oh, those baby blue eyes. Those beautiful, innocent baby blue eyes, you cheap, heartless little tramp. Wait a minute. Shut up. And tell me this, Amy. Who's it going to be after Terry Larkin? Carl. Kind of a hobby of yours, isn't it? Making a fool out of every guy you meet. I ought to do Larkin a favor. I ought to go to him right now and give him the tip off. Tell him he's due for the high dive in a couple of weeks. You're not going to go anywhere, do you understand? No. You're not going to do anything. You want to know Why? Because you're involved as much as I am. Because I can talk, too. Because if it came right down to it, I'd sound a lot more convincing to Arnold and the parole board and everybody else. Uh, what about Terry Luck? I'll see anybody I want any time I want. You know where that'll get you. I'll decide that. Now, if you don't mind, I'm going out for a drive. Wait a minute. Uh, you know what Arnold said. Skip it. When I want a chauffeur, I'll ring for one. With the prologue of Backfire, brings you another strange tale by The Whistler. And now, back to The Whistler. Carl, it's a thin line that divides love from hatred, isn't it? There's a blind, driving hate inside you, fighting for expression every minute of the time you're with Amy. Chained to that steering wheel, driving her to secret appointments with Terry, hearing her say the same things to him she used to say to you. Listening to her lie to Arnold about where she's been, realizing you're helpless, that you can't say anything. It's on your mind all the time. As you lie in bed, staring at the ceiling, unable to sleep, during the day as you go about your duties, you know now that sometime and in some way, you're going to kill her. It comes to you quite unexpectedly one afternoon, 
while you're having the family car lubricated, watching the attendant finish up. Well, there she is, Carl. I don't think you'll find a squeak in her now. Oh, yes, and by the way... Yeah? Keep an eye on that speedometer, huh? According to our records, you ran over a little this time. You mean you keep a record here? Yeah, sure, and all our customers. Oh, mileage record, huh? Mm-hmm, it only takes a minute to put it down, you know. Comes in handy sometimes. Yeah, yeah, sure. Thanks, Joe. I'll keep an eye on that speedometer. And that's all it took, Carl. A chance remark by the station attendant. Keep an eye on that speedometer, he said, and that's what you're doing. It's five miles to the Pearson home from the station, exactly five miles. And as the little figures on the speedometer drop into place, parts of a plan start falling into place in your mind. Amy and Arnold are at home. Martha, the housekeeper, took part of the afternoon off and went to a movie. Ah... By the time you arrive at the house, you've decided to take the chance. Arnold is alone in his study. You hate to disturb him, but you think there's something that he ought to know about Terry Larkin. Carl, Carl, are you positive about this? Absolutely certain? Yes, sir, I am. I'm terribly sorry, sir, and I wouldn't have mentioned it, but you seemed so upset when you heard about it the other time. I I know, I know. It's all right, Carl. You're simply doing your duty. Where is Mrs. Pearson now? I think she's in the drawing room. Uh, Thank you very much. You've been most loyal. Thank you, sir. Well, Carl, it's underway now. And as you stand alone in the study and listen, you realize how right Amy was when she said Arnold would explode if he knew the truth about her. You never heard anything like this, Quarrel. It's more than you'd hope for. Absolutely no right to accuse me that way. Did you see this man, Amy? Answer me. Did you see this man? All right. All right, Arnold. What if I did? It's nothing to you. You're so wrapped up in your career, it's a wonder you even noticed. My career has nothing to do with it. I don't care anymore. Do you understand that I just don't care? And best of all, Carl, you aren't worried about what Amy might say about you. What she says won't matter. It's what she does that concerns you now. All that matters is that she behaves you expect her to. And she does exactly. The moment the quarrel is over, she rushes out of the house and hurries across the lawn to the garage for another wild ride. You have the car all turned around, keys in the ignition ready for her. At the moment that she's sending the big car roaring down the driveway, you're reaching in her dresser drawer for her small 22 caliber pistol. And a minute later, you're walking quietly to Arnold's study for the most important step of all. Oh, oh, it's you, Carl. Yeah. She, she left in the car, didn't she? I was hoping you wouldn't let her do that. Mrs. Pearson does pretty much as she chooses. Now, wait a minute, Carl. Not only with you, Mr. Pearson, with me, too. That's quite enough, Carl. You'll do well to let the matter drop right here. Forget all about it. I'll attend to my affairs in my... Carl. Carl, what are you doing with that pistol? You don't feel like such a big shot now, do you? It kind of brings you down to size, doesn't it? Carl, 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 wait a minute. I've waited long enough. Put down that gun. Carl, have you gone crazy? (laughs) No! Yes, Carl. He doesn't look so big or successful or patronizing now, does he? And he didn't realize until too late that he made a fatal mistake when he put you in his will. Now you'll not only get back at Amy, but what did Arnold say? You'll never want for anything as long as you live. You carefully wipe the fingerprints from Amy's pistol and hide it in her bedroom, where you know it will be found. And then you hurry back to your quarters over the garage. Yes, Carl. Amy did just as you expected. And part of the gamble is won. Now the whole plan hinges on time. It's quiet now. Nothing but the tick of the clock on your dresser as you sit there, waiting for Amy to return. Five minutes. Ten, twenty, a half hour, and still no sound of the car. (laughs) 
Then you hear the squeal of tires as Amy swings into the driveway, and you know you've won. She pulls the car into the garage. The door slams, and you hear Amy's quick footsteps receding up the drive toward the house. In a half minute, you're into the garage, and those swift, sure fingers of yours are setting the speedometer back to the mileage reading it showed when you brought the car back from the service station this afternoon. Yes, that's the heart of the plan, isn't it, Carl? It begins to add up now. Those little black figures on the speedometer, plus the mileage record at the service station, will give the police one unmistakable deadly fact. That regardless of what Amy says about driving alone on the highway at the time of her husband's murder, the speedometer will show that the car had not been taken from the garage. More waiting now, Carl. More pacing back and forth in your little room over the garage. Expecting any minute to hear the scream that's sure to come when Amy discovers her husband's body. But it doesn't come. There's no sound from the house. You wonder. Then begin to be afraid. And then decide Amy simply hasn't gone into the study. Finally, at long last, you see Martha coming around the corner from the bus stop back from the matinee. You brace yourself. It'll only be a moment now. Carl! Carl, open up! Just a minute. What's the matter? Oh, Carl, Carl, it's terrible. Here, here, sit down. Oh, no. Well, what's the matter? Oh, I can't, I can't believe it. That awful, awful now get a hold woman. of yourself, Martha. What are you talking about? Mr. Pearson's dead. She killed him. What? Oh, I knew it had happened sooner or later. That vicious temper of hers. Oh, she's a devil. Where is he? In his study on the floor. Mrs. Pearson's in her room. I don't think she heard me. She's packing, packing her things. Uh. I can't believe it. Oh, Carl, we've got to do something. I won't go back into that house. I'm afraid of her. Oh, I should have warned him. I knew it had happened. I knew it. Here, just a minute, Martha. Operator. Operator, give me the police. Hurry! It's working even better than you planned, isn't it, Carl? Martha discovering Arnold. And best of all, Amy, caught in the act of packing to go away. She must have decided to do that during her wild drive. Realized it was all over with Arnold. That this quarrel was the last one. But who'll believe that story, Carl? It's so fantastic you can hardly believe it yourself. As the police car slides into the drive, the two of you run out to meet it and you wisely decide to let Martha do most of the talking. Still up there, Inspector, in her room, cold-bloodedly packing to go away. She was there when I came in and found Mr. Pearson. Carl had come home just before I did, Isn't and that I... correct? Yes, sir. I, I'd taken the car to be lubricated, of course. As soon as Martha told me, I called headquarters. I see. She doesn't know either of you two are here, eh? I went in the back door, sir. I'm sure she didn't hear me. How do you know she's packing? Her door was partly open as I sneaked down the hall past her room after I found Mr. Pierce. Why didn't you tell her about it? But I was afraid she'd turn on me, sir. Oh, she's a devil, that one. The quarrels I've seen, Inspector. The way she'd cut at poor Mr. Pearson with that vicious tongue of hers. It's a wonder it didn't happen long ago. Mm-hmm. So she bustles around in her room taking her time with her husband dead in the study. That seem right to you, Carl? Why, uh, why, it does seem odd, Inspector, That's but... putting it mildly. Mike. Yeah, Chief. Take four men and cover the exits of the house. Stay here yourself till the coroner arrives. Right. Come on, you two. Let's go up to the house. Oh, it's terrible, poor Mr. Pierce. It's hard to believe that she would do it. That's what I was thinking. Those shots were fired from a small caliber gun. Does Mrs. Pearson own one? Uh, yes, she has the twenty-two. Uh-huh. Well, let's go up and see her. There's a few questions I want to ask you, Mrs. Pearson. Uh, all right, officer. You've been a little foolish, don't you think? I I have a right to do as I please in my own house. That's a rather interesting attitude at the moment. Well, I think you might explain what this is all about, why there are officers all over this place. I was about to ask you to do some explaining. 
I haven't a thing to say. I see. Uh, Martha. Yes, Inspector. You say you were out of the house at a movie all afternoon. Uh, yes, sir. I, I just got off the bus a half hour ago and walked up to the house. And then I, I ran out to Carl's rooms over the garage. All right, Martha. And you, Carl. Yes, sir. I, I've been having the car lubricated. I just got back a few minutes before Martha. Then you were out with the car almost all afternoon? Yes, sir. That's, that's right. Carl... I'd be careful about what I said if I were you, Mrs. Pearson. Carl, what, what did you say? I said I was out with the car all afternoon. I had it greased and brought it straight home. Nothing wrong with that, is there, Mrs. Pearson? Why, I, I, I don't know what to... Inspector, if there's any question, you can check the mileage on the speedometer. May keep a record at the station. That's an idea. Now, Mrs. Pearson. Why, it... it uh, of course, yes. Yes, of course, Carl's telling the truth. He was out in the car. I've been here all afternoon. The Whistler will return in just a moment with the strange ending of tonight's story. Now back to the whistler. Well, Carl, that stopped you, didn't it? There were so many elements in the plan you couldn't calculate. Things you had to gamble on and win. Yet here in the final moment when you expect Amy to explode in a rage, to accuse you of lying... And to finally go down to defeat before the cold, accurate figures on the speedometer, she calmly tells the inspector that it's all true. That you and not she were in the car. So it wasn't necessary. All the careful planning, the manipulation of the speedometer to destroy her alibi, the mileage record, the contrived quarrel, all of it was useless. And you stand there bewildered waiting for the inspector to speak. Well, Mrs. Pearson... I hardly expected it to be that simple. You understand, of course, that you're under arrest for suspicion of murder. Murder? What are you talking about? Your husband. Arnold? What do you mean, murder? He's still right where you left him, Mrs. Pearson. On the floor of his study. I don't know anything about On it. On your own admission, you and he were alone here in the house at the time of the killing. That's good enough for me. And I think it'll be good enough for the jury. So it finally worked, Carl. And you can let down a little now. It was hard to believe, of course, the way Amy talked herself right into the trap. But she said it, and it's on the record, and you try to tell yourself you could never understand her anyway. You try to relax alone in your room, but deep inside there's a strange feeling that something's wrong, that it isn't over yet. An hour later, you're startled by a knock at your door. Oh, hello, Inspector. Carl. Where is she? Down at headquarters. Oh. Carl, you probably realize that we know about your prison record. Yeah, yeah, of course. What's that got to do with it? I got a phone call a few minutes ago. Knocked me off my pins. I don't know what you mean. Carl, you're sure you were in that car this afternoon? Oh, now, I told you you could check with the service station. We did. We checked. You drove straight home? Yeah, the speedometer... I checked that, too. Went over the whole car, as a matter of fact. The whole car? So you drove straight home, Carl. Past the corner of 89th and Fowler. Uh-huh. That's the usual route, isn't it? Yeah. The license number checks, too. Only one thing, the... Witness wasn't sure, but he thought a woman was driving. Oh, now, listen, listen. If you think Mrs. Pearson was out in that car, you're wrong. I ought to know. The station man backs me up. Yeah, just because some screwy witness thinks he saw all her, right, I... All right, Carl. That's all I wanted to know. Oh. What made you think you could get away with it? Huh? Pretty serious, you know. 
With that record of yours, you'll go up for the rest of your life in this state. What are you talking about? Manslaughter, Carl. Hit and run. That man you ran down at 89th and Fowler this afternoon died two hours ago. Let that whistle be your signal for the whistler. Each Monday at 9. Featured in tonight's story were Kathy Lewis and Gerald Moore. The Whistler was produced by George W. Allen, with story by Joel Malone, music by Wilbur Hatch, and was transmitted to our troops overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. This is Marvin Miller speaking. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.